Good evening, everyone. Good. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay, that's all. I'd like to welcome all of you to tonight's presentation, which is brought to you under the auspices of the Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar Program. I'm Doug Norton, Chair of the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at Villanova, but tonight I'm uh, acting in my role as Secretary of the Villanova Chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. Phi Beta Kappa is the nation's oldest and most widely known academic honor society. It was founded at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia on December 5th, 1776, or as we like to call it, the other 1776. The founders envisioned a society that was devoted to the pursuit of liberal education and intellectual fellowship. The Greek community's initials are Phi Beta Kappa translates roughly as the love of learning is the guide of life. Today's society not only honors the most outstanding arts and sciences majors and students at America's colleges and universities, but also advocates for liberal education in higher education and in society at large. And since 1956, the society's visiting scholar program has furthered that goal by offering undergraduates the opportunity to spend time with some of America's most distinguished scholars. The purpose of the program is to contribute to the intellectual life of the campus and the community by making possible an exchange of ideas between the visiting scholars and the resident faculty and students. Over the course of the first 55 years of the program, a total of 4,845 visits have been made by 586 visiting scholars Starting in 1956 with scholars from Oxford, London, Arizona, the Brookings Institute, Brookings Institution, and our own Bryn Mawr College in English, Anthropology, Chemistry, Economics, and Classics. Over the years, scholars have ranged from poet laureate Howard Nemirov to physicist Freeman Dyson. In fields from Asian studies to botany, urban affairs and industrial design to oceanography, paleobiology, ethnomusicology, even a few mathematicians, and history, history, history. Villanova has hosted historian Anthony Grafton from Princeton, computer scientist Hal Abelson of MIT, and English scholar Catherine Hales from UCLA. Tonight we return to UCLA and we return to history in the person of Professor Ruiz. A quick peek at Professor Ruiz's webpage yields the following quote. I hope to be able to work closely with students and to help in providing a scholarly and nurturing environment. A quick peek at a couple of the course, the online course syllabi yield the following. After a list of 25 references, the phrase, have fun. Uh, or in the schedule for the final class meeting of a course, conclusion, summations, party. <laughs> for one course, a primary source was listed as calendar of the coroner's rolls of the city of London, AD 1300 to 1378. And a secondary source was titled, the cheese and the worms. You've got to love this stuff. In an online review of his new book entitled The Terror of History on the Uncertainties of Life in Western Civilization is described as combining astonishing historical breadth with a personal and accessible narrative style in a voice that's very much that of a teacher and scholar committed to the exploration of the human condition. Teacher and scholar, questioner and nurturer, exactly the Phi Beta Kappa ideals of intellect, friendship, and morality. A perfect choice for the Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholars Program. My colleague, Dr. Rebecca Weiner, will give Professor Ruiz's official introduction. It remains for me to give thanks, some quick thanks to some of the people without whom this event would not be possible. Financial support was provided generously by the Department of History, the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures, the Villanova University Honors Program, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the Latin American Studies Program, the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies, the Villanova Center for Liberal Education, and the Office of Graduate Studies of the College of Arts and Sciences. Finally, all the planning and the legwork to pull this thing off were provided by Adriano Duque, Assistant Professor of the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures, and Rebecca Lynn Weiner, Associate Professor in the Department of History, whom I present to you now to introduce Professor Lewis. Professor Ruiz is an internationally recognized teacher-scholar 
whose latest accolade was his receipt of the National Humanities Medal from President Barack Obama last Monday. For 2012, Professor Reese was among only nine intellectuals nationwide selected. The National Humanities Medal, inaugurated by the National Endowment for Humanities in 1996, honors individuals or groups whose work has deepened the nation's understanding of humanities, broadened the engagement of American citizens with the humanities, or helped preserve and expand access to important resources in the humanities. Previous recipients have included Nobel Prize winning author Tony Morrison, novelist John Updike, Nobel Peace Prize laureate and author Elie Wiesel, and filmmaker Steven Spielberg. According to the announcement issued by the White House, Professor Ruiz was selected for his, quote, inspired teaching and writing, and, quote, because his erudite studies have deepened our understanding of medieval Spain and Europe, while his late examination of how society has coped with terror has taught important lessons about the dark side of Western progress. Professor Ruiz is the author of 13 books and more than 60 scholarly <coughs> articles and hundreds of reviews and shorter essays. The list of his academic honors is awe-inspiring and includes fellowships from the National Endowment for Humanities, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, and the American Council of Learning Societies. Professor Reese's inspiring work as a teacher led him to be chosen as one of four Outstanding Teachers of the Year by the U.S. for 1994-95 by the Carnegie Foundation. And he is honored it will be honored in April, it has been honored as a UCLA Distinguished Teacher, and will be honored in April as giving a special lecture for UCLA. And he has obviously been chosen as one of this year's handful of Phi Beta Kappa National Scholars. During his career, Professor Ruiz has taught at some of the most prestigious history programs and universities in the world. He joined UCLA's faculty in 1998 after teaching at Brooklyn College, the City University of New York Graduate Center, the University of Michigan, and the École des Hautes Études, a Sciences Sociale in Paris. Professor Ruiz has also been a frequent lecturer in Spain, Italy, France, England, Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina. As you are about to hear tonight, Professor Ruiz has a unique gift for bringing the past to life and for linking its lessons to the search for social justice in our own lives and times. His talk today is entitled The Other 1492. Please join me in welcoming, in welcoming him to the The microphone. It works? Yes. Perfect. I am delighted to be here. I'm greatly honored. This is my last Phi Beta Kappa visit. I have done seven colleges throughout the country. It is the first one. It is the last one, but it's also the first one in which I go to dinner with people who I know. <laughs> and the students have been absolutely wonderful. And the reception that I have gotten had been marvelous. The only thing we needed was sunlight. <laughs> Rebecca and Adriano and Douglas Norton and Adelt, who I have known from Princeton, they all have been absolutely wonderful. So it's a great pleasure to be here. My name is a very difficult one. You must have been thinking, what in the world is a Theophilo? Theophilo is a Greek name which means love of God, and all my students are asked to call me Theo, which means God. You are welcome <laughs> to do the same. Now, if you have difficulties calling me Theo, you can call me His Highness, His Divinity, His Mastership, something like that. Please understand what I'm doing here now is a summary, it's a synthesis of hundreds of years of history. So, it would be very sort of impressionistic and fast. It is intended to provide you with an entry into why 1492 have to be seen from a very different perspective. But it takes me an entire class, that is to say an entire quarter, 10 weeks, to deal with this material. Let us begin. We begin with a painting by Clay. It's called The New Angel, and it is a pretty ghastly angel. You will agree with me. It doesn't really seem like an angel. It seems like a demon. This is a painting that has a tremendous importance because 
a sociologist, philosopher, thinker named Walter Benjamin, a German Jew who wrote in the 1930s, saw this painting and wrote something about it. Walter Benjamin was, in a sense, trying to escape Nazi Germany, reach the Spanish border, and when he was not able to go into Spain, committed suicide. But before doing that, he wrote two short essays, which appear in a book entitled Theses on the Philosophy of History, which have been collected in a book entitled Illuminations, which was edited by Hannah Arendt. The first one is a critique of historicism. And he says in that critique of historicism some things that are somewhat self-evident, that history is always written by the winners, that the defeated seldom has history. He says they are something that I use in my classes, which is that there is no monument of civilization, which is also not at the same time a monument of barbarity, which is why he asks us to look at history from the viewpoint of the defeated, which is what I intend to do here today, and to brush history against the grain. In his other excerpt, he says the following. I have seen a painting by Clay entitled The Angelus Novus. I like to think of this painting as the angel of history. The angel of history stands on a hill. His back is turned towards the future. He looks into the past and he sees in front of him all the disasters and horrors of history piling up the wars, the injustice, the inequality, the genocides, all piling a sky high in front of him. He wants to stop them, but a wind is blowing from paradise, and it has got caught in his wings, and it propels him inexorably into the future. That pile of debris, the horrors and crimes of history and time, the horrors of mankind against other humans, is what we called progress. What he was doing was engaging in a critique of the Enlightenment project and brushing history against the grain. Well, I think it's very appropriate that I begin like this, and in fact I begin every class that I teach like this, but it's very appropriate that I begin like this because I want to bring you for a second to a year which in Spanish historiography is known as the miracle year, 1492. And in 1492, the rulers of Castile, Ferdinand and Isabella, the Catholic monarchs, carry out a series of actions which mark the year as a kind of watershed in Spanish history. On 1st January, 2nd January, and we could have a map of Spain, so the Iberian Peninsula, may I point out to you that in 1492 there is no such thing as Spain. There is a collection of kingdoms who, which in fact will not be administratively put together until the 18th century. So in 1492, on the night of January 1st, you're not going to be running back and forth. Oh, okay. Move, move it up. Between January 1st and January 2nd, Granada fell to the forces of the Catholic monarchs. We are told by the chroniclers that Isabella, who was on a camp, an encampment outside the city of Granada, saw the standards of Castile floating over the Alhambra, and she cried as a Te Deum was celebrated. We are told also how the last ruler of Granada, the last Nasrid ruler of Granada, came out from the city to surrender and to give the keys of the city to Ferdinand the Catholic. These are, of course, very romantic visions of the 19th century. It was the end of the so-called Reconquista, Reconquest, and it brought to the end the last bastion of Muslim power in the peninsula the great moment for Spain. Then, on 31st March, 
they pass an edict giving Jews the choice of converting or going into exile. Religious unity had been achieved. And then, of course, in late August of the same year, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean sea in his mistaking idea that he was going to find the Indies and instead bumping into the New World. For a Spanish historiography, this is the great moment. It is the miracle year, but it was not so for the people who suffered the consequences of this year and the fate that befell three people, the Muslims who inhabit the peninsula, the Jews and conversers who lived in this until then pluralistic society, and then the natives of the new world and in their encounter with the old. So what I want to do is to do very short histories of all these three people and to examine what were the consequences, the real consequences of that other 1492. Let us begin with Islam. As you know, the Muslims entered the peninsula in 711. Not a place where you buy a slur piece, but a date. 711. And the conquest of southern Spain, of the area that we call today Andalusia, was also marked by massive conversions of Visigothic people, uh, Ibero Roman descendants to Islam. So that in fact it is a fairly monolithic world. They created what Peter Brown once called a garden protected by our spears. And they created and brought into Iberia and into Mediterranean Europe, North Africa, Iberia, and Sicily, a superior civilization to that of the Christians. They were, the Muslims were, the great transmitters of knowledge. By 800, there is the establishment of a caliphate in Cordoba, a city of such beauty. If you have been to the mosque in Cordoba, you could see this incredible forest of arches, which is one of the most beautiful monuments in all of Western Europe. And that caliphate was indeed hegemonic in the peninsula. The few fledgling kingdoms in the north, the so-called kingdoms of Asturias and Leon and so on, lived at the mercy of the military power of the caliphate, such that in 999, Al-Mansur, one of the military leaders of the caliphate, could go all the way to St. James of Compostela, take the bells and the gates of the cathedral, and have it carried by Christian slaves back to Cordoba, a reminder of who ruled the peninsula. However, under the caliphate, there is also extraordinary cultural life, specifically that of the Jews. This is the golden age of medieval Jewry. Jews writing in Arabic, dressed like Arabs, contribute immensely to the knowledge of the period. So did Christians who took people who we call most Arabs, who while remaining Christians, dressed like Arabs, ate like Arabs, and thought and even changed their names to Arab patronymics. In 1035, the caliphate collapsed from within, and the great power of Islam was divided between all kinds of small little kingdoms, which we call the kingdoms of Taifas. They were strong enough to survive the, and continuous struggle between each other, but not strong enough to support or to withstand the Christian efforts to blackmail them. So from 1035, to around 1212, we enter into a period in which Christians and Muslims have a kind of a stalemate. The Christians threatened to invade them, the Muslims pay. In 1085, Toledo falls to the Christians under Alfonso VI. This is an incredible, shocking news to most Muslim people in Iberia but they are caught in a very difficult situation. What is the expression between a rock and a hard place? Or between the, because in the north, there are these Christians who, these 
barbarians who are continuously coming down and, and, and abusing you and taking your money and, and attacking you. And then we have our brethren in North Africa, the Almoravids, but they are incredible in their fanaticism. They are fanatics about religion. And the Muslims in Iberia have been corrupted. You all know that. You go to Madrid and the only thing you do is go for tapas. You don't learn anything. The only thing you do is drink there all the time, right? So the Muslims, we are sitting in Andalusia, in Seville. They are drinking. They are depicting the human figure. They are having a ball. Hmm. Christians in the north, this crazy is in North Africa. Hmm. What do we choose here? When the Almoravids come in 1086 and defeat Alfonso VI and put the kind of a, a barrier or stop the Christians, the Muslims within Iberia will also have to jump over the hoop. Of course, the Almoravids will become corrupt as well because after a few years, there's too much good wine and too many olives to eat and things like that. Why be so sort of fanatic and religious about these things? So they will be replaced by another group called the Almohads. In 1212, there is a, a very big battle, uh, the Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa, which is a, very ter a great turning point because it is very clear after 1212 that the Christians are on top. And when the Christians are on top, the life of the Muslims became harsher and more difficult. This coincides also with important mental changes that are occurring throughout Western Europe, and which are the, paradig the paradigm of this is, of course, the Four Lateran Council of 1215, in which the church and Northern church begins to, in a sense, try to segregate Jews and Muslims from Christian society. Jews are forced to wear an identifying mark. Muslims are expected to wear some kind of haircut that will identify them. Those suffering from leprosy have to undergo some kind of ritual which declare them death in reality. So in a sense, what you are talking about here is a great Christian military triumph parallel by changes in mentality that are triggered by the need of people in Europe or by the fact that during this period in Europe, people are developing a kind of discourses of self-identifications, identities. And when you engage in discourses of self-identification, you are also engaging in discourses against another. I am a Christian because I am not a Jew. I am a Christian because I am not a Muslim because I am not a, somebody suffering from leprosy. And essentially what you're creating is two separate societies. So there are two great and important things that are taking place in Iberia. One, the military superiority of the Christians. Two, these mental changes that will affect Jews as well. Between 1212 and 1260, the Christians advance south and conquer most of Andalusia. And the first thing they did was to empty out the cities of Muslims. They expelled from the cities all the Muslims. This was something that was, in a sense, not done until this period. The previous way of dealing with the enemy, the enemy on the mirror, was essentially that you capture them and you respect the rights you respect the religion, you respect the property, because they may capture you back, and then you expect the same. But when you are on top, then you move into a different direction, which is to essentially expel all the Muslims from the cities, from Seville, and from Cordoba, and from Cadiz, and elsewhere. And in 1264, when the Muslims rebelled in the countryside against the Christians, all the Muslims from Western Andalusia are expelled. They go to North Africa or they go to Granada. So essentially what we have is a situation where some Muslims remain on the Christian rule in the north, and we call them mudejars. They are mostly agricultural laborers. They are mostly masons. They engage in the building of churches and the like. They use a style which we call the mudejar style. In the crown of Aragon, which is what Rebecca studies, the situation is very different 
because even though there is also a rebellion in Valencia, the Muslims are not expelled. They are turned into some kind of semi servile labor, taking care of the fields. But there is something very important here, and uh, this is the thing that you must remember. One, that the Muslims who remained on the Christian rule, people we call now mudejars, are with some exceptions, people who are at the lower level in the economic scales. They are very thrifty and they have large families. They are very hardworking. They are incredibly adept at agriculture or silk manufacturing, but they are not playing a significant role in the economy of these kingdoms. The upper classes, the learned classes, with some exceptions, flee because Islam commands you not to live on the Christian rule. So those who could go, go. And it's between 1260s and 1492 that we have a situation in which the Christians could control Granada, but are unable to do so for two reasons. One, because they are torn by internal problems, and two, because Granada is a very difficult place to take. When the Catholic monarchs restore order to Castile and enact a series of reforms, one of them a military reform, led by a great military genius called the great captain, Fernando, uh, Gonzalo Fernández de Córdoba, the great captain, they are able, after 10 years of a struggle, to take Granada from the Muslims. Granada, the last bastion of Islam, is now in Christian hands. And the terms of surrender of this city were such that the Muslims were to retain the mosques, they were to retain their property, and so on. These terms were not respected. By 1499, the Muslims have been pressed to convert. The mosques had been turned into churches. They revolted. They rose up in arms in a series of hills south of Granada called the Alpujarras. They were defeated. By 1502, between 1502 and the 1520s, all throughout the Iberia Peninsula, the Muslims were forced to convert to Christianity. They converted. Those who did not flee to, the north, to North Africa converted to Christianity. We call them now Moriscos, which is a pejorative term used by the Christians to describe this supposedly converted Muslims. The reality of this is that the Muslims, the Moriscos, did not assimilate. <coughs> they dressed like Muslims, they dressed like Arabs, they spoke Arabic, they ate like Muslims, and they never made the, any serious attempt to learn about their new religion. When the Inquisition begins to investigate Moriscos in the 1530s, 1540s, when they have run already through all the conversos, the Jewish conversos, they were horrified about the fact that the Moriscos were completely ignorant of any of the principles of the Christian faith. And Philip II, in the 1560s, ordered some extraordinary measures against the Muslims, forcing them to dress like Christians, to stop speaking Arabic, and more important, to take the children away from them to be brought up by Christian families so that they could be assimilated into Christian societies. This prompted an extraordinary rebellion, a revolt in 1568, which we call the Second Alpujarras War, which was a very cruel and harsh war between Christians and Muslims, where enormous crimes were perpetrated on both sides. When the Muslims were finally defeated in 1570, they were either killed, sold to slavery, or dispersed through the rest of Castile. To make this story short, violence continued. The Muslims were seen as a fifth column, ready, in a sense, to rebel in alliance with the Ottomans that were already making inroads into the Western Mediterranean. 
And this led, at the beginning of the 17th century, to the expulsion of all the Moriscos. Around 300,000 of them were expelled from Iberia. 1492, not a good date for Muslims in Spain. 1492 was also a terrible day for Jews. Jews have appeared in the peninsula as early as the first century of the Common Era. There are reports of them in the Council of Elbira in the fourth century. They did not prosper over the Visigoths. The Visigoths are these Germanic tribes that come into the Iberian Peninsula in the fifth century. They were incredibly harsh against Jews. And in fact, one of the most remarkable things is the eerie similarity between the legislation of the Visigoths against Jews and that of Northern Castilian Christians in the 13th and 14th century. It's almost word by word they are taken from that. It is very clear that by the end of Visigothic rule, that is to say the beginning of the 8th century, the Visigoths are giving the Jews the choice of conversion or exiled. And it is then that the Muslims come. And the Muslims, as I said, was a blessing for the Jews because the Muslims, the number of Muslims and Arabs was very small so that they have made agreements with the people, with the Dimni, with the people of, who are people of the book, Christians and Jews, as long as you pay taxes and accept the superiority of Islam, you could live peacefully and prosper. And the Jews prospered on their Islam until the coming of the Almoravids and the Almohad, and then they went into the Christian north. And there they lived sometimes at peace and sometimes in conflict. One of the most debated issues in Spanish history is the issue of convivencia. There is something that Américo Castro wrote about it many years ago about the manner in which the Jews and Muslims and Christians lived in harmony in Iberia. Do we live in harmony today? Do you think they live in harmony then? I don't think so. It was a relationship which was fraught with violence and mistrust. And the Jews in Iberia, in the crowns, in the kingdoms that compose the Iberian kingdoms, did not and were not restricted to a specific trades or occupations. You could find Jews in every type of economic activity. Of course, from money lending, to banking, to financing, to doctors, to farmers, to soldiers, to artisans, to merchants. They are not restricted to a specific activities. And in many respects, the economic structure of each town determined the economic roles of Jews within the town. If the ruling class, as is the case of Burgos, they make their income from mercantile activities and finances, the Jews would be engaged in kingdom-wide finances and nothing else. In Avila, where the ruling class derives its income from the land and from the transhumans, from the movement of cattle, then the Jews and the Muslims will be found among the artisans and petty merchants and in all kinds of activities, doctors and scholars. But it is not a peaceful relationship. They trade with each other. They might even gamble with each other. They might even frequent houses of prostitution together. But there is penalties for this. By the middle of the 13th century, coincided with that incredible mental shift that took place, you have growing attacks and pejorative representations of Jews. They appear in the literature of the age and it is all the same, so we say, it, stereotypes that were common to the rest of Western Europe. Libel, the blood libel, the sacrifice of children, the desecration of the host, all those kinds of things begin to appear and the legislation attempts to segregate the Jews. 
Not successfully. The Jews continue to live in towns wherever they want, but they are more and more on the severe pressure. As the economy goes in a downturn, and we know this to be so, when the economy gets bad, you need to blame someone. Who are we going to blame for everything that is wrong? Well, today we know who we blame. We blame immigrants, Muslims, and homosexuals. There they blame Jews and Muslims. And more and more they begun to, to get serious attempts at segregating them. In 1350, there are widespread acts of violence against them related to the Black Death, but nothing and no one could ever predict what happened in 1391. In 1391, there were widespread, not in every town, but in a large number of towns throughout the Iberian Peninsula. The people rose up in arms against the Jews, incited by the preaching of mendicant priests who gave the Jews the, ch the choice between the cross and the Torah and violence. And so there is extraordinary pressure on the Jews and perhaps as many as 60% of the Jews in Iberia converted to Christianity. Many of these conversions were triggered by the violence and by fear. Some were triggered by the possibilities of gains by becoming a Christian. Some others were triggered by, occurred even before the violence. The most remarkable of these conversions, these conversions that came voluntarily and without pressure, was the conversion of the great rabbi of Burgos, a man named Seloma Halevi, one of the most learned rabbis in all of the peninsula. In 1390, before the violence, he converted to Christianity. Why? Went to Paris, took a degree in theology, went to Avignon, became a member of the clergy, then came to Spain as a bishop, and eventually became Bishop of Burgos, which was one of the richest sees in the entire peninsula. His children, for he had many, many children, before he became a Christian and a bishop, he was a wise man to do his family before taking a vow of celibacy, <coughs> all converted with him. And they all became incredibly important aristocrats and members of the royal government. This is a family of the Cartagenas. In 1421, when John II comes to Burgos for the first time and he has this incredible royal entry, the city shows Alonso de Cartagena, who eventually became a bishop of Burgos as well, to defend, be the defender in the joust organized by the city. So they are at the gates of Burgos, stood Alonso de Cartagena, born a Jew, the son of a Jew, holding the honor of defending the city against all comers. Only in Spain you could have something like this. The family is the family of the Santa Maria. is one of the most prestigious families in all of Spain, and they were exempted from the estatutes of cleanliness of blood. In 1391, you have a situation where you have massive numbers of conversos. The Jews who remain become far more religious. They withdraw from the cities. They go to small towns and place themselves under the protection of local lords because central power has collapsed. And then you have massive conversos. And they are not all conversos are alike. They are the conversos who are the Jews at the highest level, the aristocratic, powerful, influential Jews who convert. They move right away into the aristocracy. They marry into aristocratic families. Ferdinand the Catholic had a converso ancestry. The middling sorts of the Jewish conversos move also without it missing a beat into municipal offices, 
into the cathedral chapters, into the universities, into the royal bureaucracy. They do very well. They are the new men. And then the large mass of poor Jews who work in the towns remain where they lived, marry endogamously, marry each other, and maintain practices which will identify them as a still practicing some form of Judaism, mostly by the women, lighting candles on Friday, taking a bath on Friday, unheard of taking bath at this time in the Middle Ages, a bath once a year, but not every Friday. There must be something wrong with these people. <laughs> and you could see how by the 1440s, you will have essentially a great deal of fear of these new Christians, these conversos, who are not trusted and who are in competition with all Christian elites. By the 1440s, there are riots against the conversos and the development of a vitriolic attacks against the conversos. In 1478 or 1484, depending the date, the conversos themselves are perhaps the initiators of the people who begin to ask for the idea of having a way of policing these boundaries of orthodoxy. It is then that the Inquisition is born. The Inquisition has never operated in Castile because the kings of Castile refused to allow the papacy to have any say in the exercise of justice within the kingdom. The Spanish Inquisition is a very strange fish. It is an Inquisition, it's an ecclesiastical Inquisition, but it is under the control of the monarchy. As Philip II once says, religion is too important to leave it to the Pope. That is to say, it is under the thumb of the king. The Inquisition was an incredibly nefarious institution and a deceiving one. The first Grand Inquisitor, the famous Torquemada, was asleep in the class. <laughs> the famous Torquemada <laughs> was himself a member of a very famous Converso family. Did you know that? No. Good, yeah. <laughs> a very famous Converso family. And of course, the Inquisition, they come into town, they come into Villanova with their green flags and all that. Green banners. Anyone who has anything to confess, come out and confess. Well, Americans should know something about this. Americans are always confessing. Turn your television. I did that, I did that. I am a good Cuban. I did nothing. I don't confess anything. Because if you confess one, you are in trouble. The Inquisition will forgive you if you confess. But then, the next time they catch you, you are in trouble. They will burn you. So, there is a growing crescendo of attack on Jews. I have argued, not on Jews, on conversos. Inquisition does not have jurisdiction over Jews only over conversos. I have argued, I think I am right, but I might be wrong, that the Inquisition targets certain social groups. That is to say, the very wealthy conversos don't get touched. The middling conversos rarely get touched. The people who get touched are the people at the bottom. And that in many respects, the Inquisition is an instrument to keep Castile, above all, as a kind of economic system that depended on land rents and the transhumans that sought to prevent any kind of commercial development or mercantile development. In the crown of Aragon, the Aragonese knew exactly what the Inquisition was, an attempt of, the, of Castile to impose their will on them. In fact, the Inquisition until the 18th century is the only national institution in all of the Iberian Peninsula. It's the only way in which you can get people at a distance from there. So, 
1492, for reasons that are not very clear, the Catholic monarchs pass an edict giving Jews, Jews, not conversos, a choice between exiled or conversion. Henry Kamen has argued that there were around 80,000 80, Jews left in the peninsula, of which half of them left, 40,000, while the other 40,000 converted. This, this, these figures are really very debatable. 1492 was not a very good year for the Jews or the conversos, because the conversal trials continue until the 1520s, and they were pretty savage. Not only will they bring you to trial and kill you, but they will even take your body from the earth and burn it as well. There are ways of avoiding this, and there are incredible number of examples of conversos who self-fashion themselves into other families. The most important saint in the 16th century, Santa Teresa of Avila, and she was a descendant of a converso from Toledo. They escaped to Avila and remade themselves into a totally Christian family. In 1492, a Genoese sailor, yes, Columbus was not Italian. Yes, he was not Italian, he was a Genoese. Yes, Columbus was not a converso. Columbus was not from Barcelona. Columbus was not from, I don't know, from Villanova. He was from Genoa, and we know his family, and we have all the documents. This man was totally insane. <laughs> he wrote little comments on prophecies, on the side of prophecies. He had this bizarre idea, taken from a map from Toscanelli, that if he sailed westward, he could reach the Indies. Why sailing westward? Because by 1492, the trade with India was going to be solely in the hands of the Portuguese, who had been sailing into the Atlantic, had been sailing south of Cape St. Vincent, all the way down the coast of Africa, around Africa, and in 1494 will reach India, Vasco da Gama, and bring down, bring back a ship laden with the spices. That was the great discovery and the great moment in European civilization, not Columbus. He comes to the Catholic monarchs with this crazy plan. In 1492, only high school students in Pennsylvania believed that the earth was flat. <laughs> Everybody knew that it was round. Anybody who sailed the sea knew that it was round. But what was there to lose? Give him three ships and a few men, send them over and see what happens. Those are the voyages of Columbus. He was a great sailor, but totally insane. He died, he was also a terrible administrator. He died still thinking that he has discovered in the world. In his fourth voyage, he went to the mouth of the Orinoco and thought that he has reached the earthly paradise. Do you see how this man, where he was, his mind was? Instead of finding Japan and China, he bumped into the islands in the Caribbean, into the Bahamas first. But where are the great civilizations here? These are people who are naked, running around in these paradisical lands, and so in the first accounts of the first voyage and the second voyage, which are critical for our understanding of how Europeans, Castilians in this case, reacted to the encounter with new people, you see the manner in which they think of these people as being a pre-Lapsarian world, the natural men and women, the people who lived before the fall, Somehow the fall took place elsewhere. This was people who lived before the fall. But then on the other hand, they speak of them as beastly and describe them as cannibals, which of course gave them the right to enslave them as well. The reality of the first encounter between Europeans and natives 
because it was not a discovery, I mean, there were people living there, is that within a generation, the entire population of the Caribbean disappear, killed by illnesses and by work. But it is also that the Caribbean did not yield any gold or silver or spices. The Spaniards came in and could not adapt themselves to the climate and the diet of these islands. My family came to Cuba from Northern Castile and every day at lunch, because we slept the siesta and all that, they had these huge stews and bottles of wine. And at the age of 50, they all exploded. <laughs> because you know, go to the tropics eating heavy stews and drinking heavy red wines. So where is the game? 1517, and there is nothing that we can get. This is a drain on our treasure. In the meanwhile, the Portuguese are racking it in with all those spices. Ah, but in 1517, a man named Hernán Cortés disobeyed his orders and marches into the Valley of Mexico. And there he finds a society that it is extremely developed and well organized. And when he reaches the city of Mexico, Tenochtitlan, and the people who we misguidedly call Aztecs, but who call themselves Mexica, he finds a city that is larger than any other city in the Western Hemisphere. The city on the lake, Mexico Tenochtitlan. Bernal Diaz del Castillo, writing many, many years afterwards in the city of Guayacán, a very beautiful place outside Mexico City, in what was the true history of the conquest of, the new, of new Spain, he tells us of his first vision of Tenochtitlan. He tells us that he's walking across the vast causeway that leads from Estrapalapa into Tenochtitlan. And the Spaniards had seen, Castilian, not Spaniards, the Castilians had seen all these huge monuments and temples and queues. And he has no words to describe this, but to think of this as something taken out from the pages of the Amadis of Gaul, from the great images of romance of the greatest 15th century romantic romance. And as he thinks of this place, as something out of the pages of this book. Now, I have to disabuse you of one notion here. The Castilians never conquer Mexico Tenochtitlan. The Spaniards never won. The handful of Spaniards with dogs and horses could have never brought this empire to his knees. It was a 100,000 native allies who have been victimized by the Mexica in these flowery wars which they got to capture people and sacrifice them in this sacrificial stone that allied themselves with the Spaniards because they thought incorrectly that if they could use the Spaniards to defeat the Mexica, then they can turn against the Spaniards and conquer them. But it didn't work that way. We know the story. This is Charles II, who will be the emperor, Charles II, Charles V, what the second? Charles V. Go, let's go. And let's run through these images, but not to the end. You can see this is the kind of codexes that are called, collected afterwards by missionaries, a form of kind of ethnography. This is an incredibly sophisticated civilization. I don't want to tell you here all the events that led to the final conquest of the city, but since we are running out of time to just tell you briefly that at the very end of the city, when the city, when the Mexica were dying of illnesses, of plagues that were running around the city, and they refused to surrender. And in the last days of the city, we know this from native sources that have been uncovered only very recently. They chose a great warrior and they dressed him in quetzal plumes 
and they armed him with obsidian knives and mace, and he jumped into the Spaniards. And if he would have defeated the Spaniards, the city would have been safe. We know nothing of what happened to this warrior. We know that the Mexica lost because they fought only to capture an enemy instead of fighting in the kinds of formations that the Spaniards have learned to use in the wars in Granada and in Italy. And the city fell. Hernán Cortés wrote a letter to his emperor, to Charles V. This is Hernán Cortés with La Melinche, the kind of native interlocutor. She's giving another name by the Mexicans, and it's not La Melinche, a nasty name. And Hernán Cortés writes a note, a letter. It's called Carta Relación, Tercera Carta Relación, to the emperor in Europe, in Germany. And he tells him that as the city fell, he released his Tlaxcalan allies to create havoc in the city. And they systematically slaughter men, women, and children and Cortés, who had actually abetted their crimes, tells the emperor that he had never seen such inhuman behavior, had never seen such beastly actions. But when we brand others, whether Muslims or Jews or conversos or natives in the New World, inhuman, then we assuage everything that prevents us from exterminating and killing them. In 1492, it was not just a miracle year. It was a year in which several people who had lived in Iberia for centuries, who were an integral part of the civilization and of the things that made Spain what it is to this very day, visit the synagogue of the Transito, see the austerity, the pride, of a synagogue built in the 14th century when everything was going wrong. Think of the serenity of the place. Think of the Alhambra built also in the 14th century when there was no future. Think of what these people did and what was essentially taken from them and from the very soul of Spain by 1492. Let's go to the end because the end is a painting by Goya, which is the cover of my book, which is Saturn eating his children, but it is also history eating us. Thank you. You, the first question. First question? Yes. <laughs> My friend. Um, how did this, uh, like, when this continued on, how, like, I know that they continued to go into um, South America. Did they still, continue, like, when they took down the Incan Empire, did they use the same sort of methods? Uh, the question is, when they used, when they took the Inca Empire out, mm -hmm. which is in the 1530s, right after, the, Inca, the, the defeat of the Inca was very different from that of the Mexica, because Pizarro was also very weird fellow, very bizarre fellow. The problem is that the, <laughs> you agree with me? Eh? <laughs> the, the problem was that the Inca Empire, which was this extraordinarily complex structure, simply collapsed. But these empires did not collapse because they believed the Spaniards to be gods, or because they were afraid of dogs and horses. They collapsed because they have been maintained by an exercise of force and by collecting tribute from people that it was unsustainable. Mexico and Peru are the two real interesting places 
in Latin America because they are the two places where native cultures really remain and survive. So that in Mexico, there are people, a lot of people who still speak Nahua and Zapotec and Mixtec. There is a lot of people who speak Quechua in Ecuador and Peru to this very day. So these are live languages. Another question, please, please ask me a question. I need to earn my keep here. Um, would you consider the Inquisition a uh, form of terrorism and Torquemada a uh, form of terrorist? Do I consider the Inquisition a form of terrorism and Torquemada a terrorist? Uh, the Inquisition was not a form of terrorism and Torquemada was not a terrorist because the Inquisition was exceedingly legalistic. That is to say, if I am a terrorist, I kill you right away. The Inquisition is interested in ferreting out heterodoxy, but also in convincing you and reintegrating you into the systems of beliefs. It's not enough that we find you guilty. It's that you have to find yourself guilty and repent. So the best records in Europe are Inquisition records. They are also the most problematic. Because inquisitors, whether it is to conversos or moriscos or heretics or people in Italy, will continually ask you questions. Questions that are geared to obtaining certain answers. And they will torture you, and they will ask you, and they will continue to ask you. And then if you are really guilty, they will find you guilty, and they will bring you to a place where your guilt will be determined, and where you are expected to ask for forgiveness. And then they will release you. This is a, the kind of phrases that we use to this very day. They release you to the secular authorities that will burn you or kill you if they decide that you should not be burned. But what is important and what is uh, terrifying, to use a terrorist metaphor, about the Inquisition is this attempt to reintegrate you into the system. And it's also that it is secret denunciations. But if you can find, if you name that you have your enemies and you name them and it's one of the people who have denounced you, that denunciation is not valid. But it is a kind of system of fear. The, the Inquisition is a system of fear. The Inquisition only killed 5,000 people over its entire, over its entire 300 years of existence, which is nothing compared to the kinds of massacres that we have perpetrated in the 20th century. But the nefarious aspect of Inquisition is not the people it kill, but in the kind of attempt to create a uniform system of beliefs and imposing their own sense of the world on you. And of course, many of the people who are accused of being conversos, Judaizers is the term that is used, are not Judaizers at all. These are people who are probably unbelievers, though it is impossible to determine unbelief in this period yet. Somebody in Zaragoza, who in 1485 says, well, I don't believe in heaven or hell. To be rich is to be in heaven. To be poor is to be in hell. The Inquisition says, Jewish ideas, condemn him. If Christianity would not have spread to Spain, the kingdoms would have united? Do you feel that the kingdoms would have united under another bond? No. The, 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 one of the things is, if, if Christianity would not have expanded to Spain, the Christians would have united. The problem with the different kingdoms of Spain is that they have very different economic structures, demographic resources, and culture. 
what people forget about Spain is that there is no such thing as Spain. It's an artificially constructed country. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> because the Catalans will argue correctly that they are far closer to southern France, to Occitania, medieval Occitania, than they are to Castile. It's a different language, it's a different culture, it's a different world. And we see the results of this. There are all these autonomies, and one doesn't want to have anything to do with the other. The Basque, what do the Basque have to do with anything in the rest of the world? And so you, what you have is really, it's the famous book by Ortega Gasset, it's invertebrate Spain. It's a, it's a country without a spine. It's really a, a, a collection of things, united by force and by the hegemonic power of Castile. And there is a, a tremendous price to pay for that. On the Franco-Catalans, we are not allowed to use the language. Well, you get what you saw. Can you talk about the source material that we have for Columbus's voyages? How much oh. do we have? How reliable is it? What language is it in? We have some problems. The log of the first voyage. Well, first of all, there is a collection called the Racolta, which was put together in 1898 for the 400th anniversary. Then that collection was amplified in 1998 by 1994, sorry, 1894, 1994, in something that was published at UCLA, which is called the Repertorio Colombiano, and I was a member of the board, which is all the documents of the encounter. The documents were, were in Italian, in Latin, in Spanish. We know everything that we want to know. However, the first voyage of Columbus is problematic because the log of the, of the voyage, which was altered by Columbus himself, was lost and was copied by Bartolomé de las Casas, who was incredibly keen on promoting Columbus. So what we get is not the reality. The best source for the first encounters is the accounts of the second voyage which were written by a civilian doctor called Álvarez Chanca. He is a doctor of the Municipal Council of Seville. He's the first doctor to come to the New World, and he writes a very interesting description of the second voyage of Columbus, which is the voyage to settle, when he comes with 17 ships, a thousand men, and all those animals that are going to destroy the ecology of the Caribbean sheep and horses and the like. You said that uh, the, in the wars before the 15th century between the Christians and the Muslims, they treated each other fairly civilly, knowing that they would be at war again and want to be treated the same. Up to 1212. Up to 1212, I'm sorry. Yeah. What caused the break in that pattern? What made the Christians suddenly accept that they wouldn't be reconquered? They were on top. In, in 1212, they defeated the Almohad army. They tore to pieces. There was an international army, an international crusade. Frenchmen, people from the Crown of Aragon, Castilian armies, Portuguese armies, came down to an area in Andalusia and in a, in, a, in a place called Las Navas de Tolosa, defeated the army, took all the treasure, took the banners, which you could still see in the, in the Abbey of Las Huelgas in Burgos. And therefore, it was very clear that what you needed to do is mop up whatever was left, which they did. The conquest of Seville, Cordoba in 1236, Valencia in 1236, Seville in 1248, Cadiz soon afterwards, Puerto de Santa Maria, all these places. So the Muslims can no longer win. And you could see the incredible changes that are coming when you see that there is an, a Christian expedition against the port of Saleh in North Africa in the Atlantic, North Africa, and all the people are put to death. That was never done, because up to 1212, it's not clear who's going to be on top. And so people sort of, 
the reality of this, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, the reality of this is that when the Muslims are on top, they can be harsh at times, but on the whole, they were pretty relaxed about religious minorities in the midst. The best example of this is the Ottoman Empire, which was a multilingual, multi-ethnic um, empire. When the Christians are on top, there are times in which things are all right, but on the whole, it's pretty harsh. Jews are expelled from England at the end of the 13th century. You could see how this is like a cascade. They are expelled from northern France. They are expelled from the area of Naples in 1285. They are expelled from northern France at the beginning of the 14th century. They are expelled from southern France at the end of the 14th century, except for the papal cities in which the Jews were allowed to remain. They are expelled from Iberia in 1492. So you could see growing antagonisms, growing less tolerance of others in your midst. Of the uh, Muslims and Jews who were expelled from Spain and then went to North Africa, is there any connection between them moving to North Africa and then the uh, rise of the Barbary states and the Muslim pirates in the Mediterranean? Oh yes, indeed. I am working on this right now. <laughs> the North Africa in the 16th century is a place of very active piracy, corsair activity. Most of it renegades. That is to say, Christians who have converted to Islam. And they are very famous ones. Or people who are descendants of Eastern Mediterranean Christians and who become Muslims. The most famous ones are the Barbarossa family that they continuously rate. And if you read Cervantes, you could see the fear that exists in Spain of these corsairs. They take you prisoner, they bring you up, they take you to the prisons in Algiers or Tunis and to get ransom for you or to turn you into slaves. The Christians are also corsairs. It's not just the Muslims. And they are some Moriscos who are corsairs and uh, uh, David Col Coleman is, is working on some of this and it's very interesting. However, there is a reality here. More Christians convert to Islam than Muslims convert to Christianity. Don't know why. I'm interested in your thoughts about the degree to which the trajectory of the conquest of the New World after the fall of Mexico and Peru uh, was influenced by the prior experiences between Christianity and the Muslims and Jews in Spain. Absolutely. The, the Spaniards transport the institutions and the culture. Now, I have to say this. Spain is extraordinarily successful in its imperial effort. But they also transport the culture, their economic structures. Andalusia was a land of latifundia, dating from the mid-13th century, when the Christians took Andalusia from the Muslims. They were incapable of keeping up the kind of husbandry that the Muslims have utilized. They turned the land into pasture lands. And they established some of the great families in Andalusia. Those cortijos are still there. Those latifundia are still there, and they brought latifundia to Latin America, and it's still there. And so they brought also an attitude towards natives. The natives were to be converted, but yet never to be equal. Right? Oh, you invent such things like the Virgen de Guadalupe to placate them, but you are never the same. And in the 18th century, they developed this casta system. Now, it's very fluid, the castas, because you could always go back to being a Spaniard if you marry the right person. But there are certain racial gradations that are kept. And the reality of Latin America, let's face it, is that a small, creole, 
Spanish descendant elite has ruled Latin America until two hours ago. And continue, look at the Spanish Latin American television, look at Mexican television. If you look at the television, everybody in Mexico is blonde. Right? Where the hell are the natives? Nowhere to be seen. You spoke of widespread pogroms around 1391. Was that a new development in Spain or were there other... 1391 is uh, rushing up the volume a lot. There have been attacks in 1350, there have been attacks before. I gave you a list of attacks. So you could see that this is a perennial problem. The problem in 1391 is that it is widespread and unlike previous attacks, the, the, the kind of aim is to convert by force. Now there are towns that miss the entire thing. Avila has no programs, no conversions, no inquisition trials or activities. Becomes a refuge for conversos who want to reshape their identity. But 1391 is, we are still grasping historically. In fact, this is a great, uh, Rebecca, this is a great problem with David Nirenberg's book, is that we, he never explained 1391, and he had been working on this. So we are still grasping what happened in 1391 that really led to this incredible violence. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you, yeah, I answer you. Would you say it's fair to say that the Battle of Toledo was for the Muslim dominion, what the Battle of Manskirt was for the uh, Byzantine? That the Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa? Or, or yeah, the Las Navas de Tolosa was the same as Manskirt. Yeah, although Mansikert had, Mansikert is a battle in Anatolia where the Ottoman forces tore apart a Byzantine army. Mansikert has long-term consequences, so does the Las Navas de Tolosa. So in many respects, yes, they, they are something that can be comparable. That would be a nice paper to write, comparison between Mansikert and Las Navas. Hey, that's it, Rebecca, it's gonna do it. Good idea. The problem with Mansikert is that the Byzantine emperor is so desperate because these Ottomans are not Ottoman, actually it's, the, it's a different kind of Turks, the Seljuk Turks are advancing and he makes the terrible mistake of calling from, for aid from the west. And what he got was a crusade. And the crusade was not what the Byzantine emperor wanted. So he ended up with a rough deal there. He ended up with such a rough deal that on the fourth crusade, the Venetians who are paying for the fourth crusade say, hmm, the Holy Land, which is in the hands of these incredibly capable rulers and have defeated us and have taken back Jerusalem. Hey, there is Constantinople, which is filled with relics and treasures. Let's attack Constantinople. And they sack the city and establish a Latin rule there. Oh, yes. Is race a factor in determining that, or is it the, usually made by thinking? Uh, strangely enough, the concept of race is really developed only in the 15th century. So then it's primarily faith, which would... It's, it's faith. The reality of this is that it is impossible to tell a Muslim, a Jew, and a Christian apart in the street, unless you dress them differently, unless you make signs of them. If you can cross over, no one will recognize you. The reality of this is that is the case today. David Nirenberg has been working on questions of race, and he argues, and I think correctly, that it has to do also with animal breeding that begins to be. So the racializing people, which is what certain epithets is all about, um, is part of that process that begins at the very end of the Middle Ages. Now, may I also point out to you that race is a, is a culturally constructed uh, category. People who are black here are not black in Cuba or in Brazil. You know, it's, 
each culture constructs race in a specific way. Come on, don't be shy. You talked about the artificiality of Spain as a country. Did, and granted there, there were, I don't know what, seven, eight kingdoms in Spain? In, 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 14, in, Iberia, in Iberia, in the peninsula, in 1492, there are five kingdoms. There is the kingdom of Granada, before, well, before 1492, the kingdom of the crown of Aragon, which is a strange thing, because it's really a, a kind of European Union in the making, because you have the, the kingdom of Aragon, the county of Barcelona, the kingdom of Valencia, and that's not even talking about the Balearics and Italy and Sicily, which are part of the Crown of Aragon. Then you have the Kingdom of Navarre, which is a strange place too because it's half French, half Spanish, and that by that time it had a French royal family ruling it, which, strangely enough, is the same family in the early 16th century that will come to rule Spain in the 18th century and that rules Spain to this very day. Juan Carlos is a descendant of the people who were kings of Navarre in the 16th century, the Albrecht Bourbon. Henry IV of Bourbon is the king of France and then the father of that dynasty that will send. And then you have Portugal, and then you have the kingdom of Castile. So you have five kingdoms before 1492. I guess my, my question then is, does the addition of the, the new world, you know, the beginning of, of imperialism in that way, or colonialism, does that further, um, does that help or hurt the, 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 the political separation of Spain at this time? It, 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 uh, it helps the political separation because the new world does not belong to anyone but Castile. Aragonese and Catalans and, and are not allowed to travel to the new world. Only Castilians are to enjoy this. This is very clear. The Aragonese have nothing to do with this. It all belongs to Castile. Only later people will be allowed to come, but only after the 18th century. But in the period before, we have the list of all the people who come to the new world. We have that list. You all have to go through Seville. It's all very legalized. The civilians are there. And what do you mean? You are a conversa? You are a Morisco? You are a Catalan? You are an Aragonese? You are not going. You are not going to the new world. You are not going to the new world. Yes. Um, well, we actually have a reception outside. Oh, well. Uh, so a, a, any, any more questions? Or should we do some outside, maybe one-on-one -on -one a little bit? Whatever you Sound wish. Good? All right, thank you so much.